presentation and uh, good evening to all of you. I'll try to cover all these topics that Edward referred to within uh, 30 minutes. I'll do my best. I think I have more have slides. Four, you'll have 40 minutes. But still, I, I would like to have discussion, so it's something that I need to highlight here, that I would look forward to our interaction. Uh, let me begin with some main points that I would like to introduce from the very beginning, and from that point onward, I will move to the study of each specific country case. I suggest I begin with Cyprus, which is a country with a long-standing political problem and a sort of more recent economic problem that definitely is very important for Eastern Mediterranean security and uh, for Greek-Turkish relations. I also talk about the energy parameter briefly because I do think that that provides a new uh, instrument for promoting conflict resolution in the Cyprus issue. And from that point onward, I will also look into how the crisis has affected Greece, its relations with Turkey, with Greek foreign policy, and I will also look into the case of Turkey as well. So I'll try to wrap everything up. Uh, my main point, as you see on the slide, is that the Eurozone crisis had a variable impact on Eastern Mediterranean countries, and uh, I think it's important to highlight that uh, the EU's role in Eastern Mediterranean was meant to promote peace and conflict resolution. Actually, it was one of the main uh, strategic objectives of Greek foreign policy in the 1990s, bringing the European Union towards the Cyprus issue, uh, removing the Greek veto against Turkey-EU relations, it was meant to facilitate a process of uh, conditionality and a process of reform in Turkey, and also provide the confidence environment for the resolution of the Cyprus issue. Unfortunately, this didn't happen as we know. Nevertheless, the presence of the European Union has been strong, in my view, in the last years. And the question is whether and how this uh, presence can become stronger and can become a catalyst towards conflict resolution. In the case of Greece, uh, the country has had a deep economic, political, and social crisis. I think that that's important to highlight that the economic crisis in Greece is only the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, I think that it's sort of, uh, that's something that we need to keep in mind when we talk about comparison between Greece and other Eurozone countries or Greece and Cyprus. In a sense, I think that the situation with Greece is more difficult because of the underlying uh, structural problems that have accumulated over the last decades. And they're more difficult to resolve than a sort of a liquidity or a solvency crisis in in a sense, the country needs, needs a new uh, development model overall, which is something ma far more than just resolving a debt a crisis. Cyprus is different in that respect because Cyprus did not share the same structural uh, sort of deficiencies of Greece. So Cyprus economy, Cyprus public service, public sector uh, wasn't... Uh, as problematic as in the case of Greece, but Cyprus was hit very severely as a result of the Greek haircut. So uh, in a sense, the Cyprus crisis was a derivative of the Greek crisis to a very significant degree. And of course, there is the political problem in the island that always plays a role. So in a sense, uh, the absence of a political solution on the Cyprus issue becomes not only a significant security liability for Cyprus, but also an economic liability. In a sense, a lot of the economic potential of the Republic of Cyprus remains underdeveloped due to the presence of the problem. If we move to the Turkish case, I think that the Eurozone crisis was an additional con contributing factor to Turkey's rising self-confidence. One of the most interesting features mm -hmm. in Turkish politics over the last years was the I idea that Turkey doesn't need the EU, the EU needs Turkey more than Turkey needs the EU, and Turkey can have a very successful sort of career as an independent uh, individual player in the international global politics. So, like self-confidence may have reached the point of arrogance at some point, and I think this is now becoming clear that especially in the context of the Arab Spring, Turkey has failed to fulfill expectations about 
having a pivotal role in the, in the region, shaping developments in Egypt or Syria and other parts of the Middle East. And I think that's something that's also very important. Neglecting this European link also contributed to the rise of domestic political conflict. So in that respect, many of the achievements of Turkey in the early reform years of the AKP administration were compromised. And uh, this has had, I think, a very significant negative effect on the soft power potential of the country. Turkey appeared to, although Turkey has the second biggest army in NATO, Turkey has attempted to present itself as a soft power in the region, the country whereby a major economic, uh, economic miracle is taking place and democracy is being built year after year. This story was valid for many years, maybe mm -hmm. until 2007, 2008, but it's very hard to support it today. And I think this uh, culminated with the Gezi events and with this graft investigation. And this has weakened the Turkish foreign policy position to a very significant degree because Turkey is very hard. It's very hard today to present Turkey as a role model to a country in the Middle East or in the, the Caucasus or in Central Asia. So having said all these points, I'd like to let's go first to Cyprus because I think that that might be the most uh, important parameter of uh, the, the most important issue to discuss. How has the Eurozone crisis affected the Cyprus issue? I think that it's important to remember that the European Union has become one of the most important actors of the Cyprus question since the 90s, and that was mainly to, due to Greek sort of manipulation. The Greek uh, foreign policy was to bring the European Union in because it was perceived that the European Union would provide an environment whereby the principles that the Greek Cypriot side and the Greek side considered in necessary for the resolution of the conflict, all these principles would be present. And the idea was that membership and solution would come together. So this was the initial planning of the Papandreou Simitis, the jo yeah. Simitis Papandreou administration. Nevertheless, for reasons that we can discuss in the Q&A section, it's not part of the core presentation because it's more contemporary. This didn't happen. And uh, the membership of the Republic of Cyprus without a prior solution disturbed this balance. So in that respect, uh, the fact that the Republic of Cyprus became an insider provided negative incentives for the resolution of the Cyprus issue. So the Cyprus government was part of the European Union now, so in a sense it had a veto power against Turkey. And this uh, led to the perception to many Greek Cypriots that they can get a better deal than what the UN negotiated platform was giving them. This proved to be not the case, not least because of the fact that Turkey's interest in the EU waned, so the ability of the Greek Cypriots to ex extract concessions also diminished. But I think right now we're in a, interest, in a very interesting moment because, as Edward mentioned, we're having new negotiations and uh, it might be the best opportunity in the last 10 years, ever since the failed unemployment mm -hmm. referendum, that we may be coming to a point that there might be a significant window of opportunity. Why is this the case? I think that uh, we can argue that there are many reasons for that. One reason for that is that um, the President of the Republic of Cyprus is someone that has proven in the past and then under very adverse circumstances that he is in favor of the compromise solution. He was Mm -hmm. the very the, the single Greek Cypriot politician that defended an unemployment based solution. He recommended a yes vote to the referendum, and his political career almost came to nothing as a result of this. Nevertheless, he recovered, and he's now back into power. So he is sort of he has like good credentials on the on his willingness to come up with a, comp a solution in the Cyprus issue. Something else that I think is very important is that uh, the Cyprus issue has somewhat lost its uh, appeal to the public opinions of both Greece and Turkey, and this means that it's not as easy to use it as an instrument to mobilize nationalist uh, sentiments that can sort of uh, obstruct any conflict resolution process. Ten years ago, the Cyprus issue was very heavily discussed in, Cyp in Greece and in Turkey, I find it very unlikely that it would attract this level of interest and sort of tension if we come again close to a referendum 
in the near future. Both countries have a very packed and very intense political agenda. So in that respect, I think that this is good for the problem because the problem can be discussed and solved on its own merits. Like adding uh, domestic Greek politics or domestic Turkish politics into the equation is likely to make the solution more difficult. It's definitely not going to help this. Another very important parameter which I think needs to be highlighted is energy. Uh, over the last years, it has become confirmed that uh, significant energy uh, resources are to be found in the seabed of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, these uh, findings mainly refer to Israel, but a substantial part of these appear to be within the Cyprus exclusive economic zone. Of course, such discussions about energy raise a lot of hype and optimism. I don't think that Cyprus will become a petrostate. Mm -hmm. But it's very likely that Cyprus will have a substantial new income source in the near and medium future. This income might be an additional instrument into building uh, a new sort of solution finding a way to develop incentives that will bring Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, and other countries in the Middle East closer and develop interdependency links that will only, not only help find the solution, but also help implement the solution, because that's something very important that needs to be highlighted, that agreeing on a text, on a solution of the Cyprus conflict, it's just the beginning of the real problem. The real problem is to make this agreement work and in the end make the people of, like the communities in Cyprus feel close to each other and uh, make them like live together as they haven't been doing for the last 50 years. This is not easy and I think the real difficult job will begin after the solution of the problem. Mm -hmm. I think energy could provide an interesting uh, uh, sort of instrument in that respect. If we look into the negotiations as they go on, uh, we talked about uh, the resumption of the negotiations after uh, a break of uh, several months. What is very optimistic, I think, in my view, is that uh, both the, the chief negotiators of both sides appear to be moderate figures and people that know the problem very well, and I refer to Mr. Mavroyanis and Mr. Ozersai on the both sides. Both of them are very good, are like deep experts of the problem and they have shown their willingness to come up with compromise solutions and listen to the opposite side and sort of try to understand what the legitimate concerns of the other side is. So this is something to be kept in mind. It's also very important to highlight that there is a framework document now, a communique that was of actually the reason for the delay of the start of the negotiations. But there is now a document that frames the negotiations. So negotiations won't be unstructured, just going on forever and ever. There are some conditions, there are some issues that the Turkish Cypriot side had set, there are some issues that the Greek Cypriot side had set. So it's more difficult for this negotiation to get lost into like sort of like tiny details. What will this negotiation go about? Of course, the, there are four key issues that I kind of, uh, the Cyprus uh, negotiations go on. The first is territory, it's the governance issues, it's the security issues, it's the economic issues. I have a map here, uh, I, I, on the slide I refer to the territorial adjustments that are likely to happen in, a co in the context of a conflict resolution. Uh, these were the territories that were also negotiated in the context of the Annan plan. I think it's important to highlight this, if you see the pictures, uh, this referred to the new city of Amagusta, which is also called Varosha or Marash in Turkish. This is likely to get a lot of uh, publicity in the very near future because of uh, the intention of the Greek Cypriot side to bundle it into a conf confidence building measure mm -hmm. agreement. So the argument is that in order to catalyze public opinion support for a solution of the Cyprus problem, there has to be an early starting point, something that will change the sort of discourse. 
but uh, from a pessimistic sort of nothing can happen, sort of like it's futile, it's worth, it's not mean anything approach. We may come to the point that some refugees are, you are used to li living in this uh, city that you see on the pictures, and today remains vacant. It's a ghost okay. city, really, a very odd uh, picture. They may be allowed to go back to their homes. At the same time, the embargo against Turkish Cyprus is relieved. So there has, there a formula is found so that uh, flights towards the north part of Cyprus are free, which are not today, outside Turkey. And trade are also, trade uh, barriers are also lifted. So this is a parameter that I think needs to be kept in mind because I think that it's very likely uh, for this issue to be put forward before we come to a referendum because the whole idea is to come to a referendum after having uh, consolidated public opinion support for the project. And some, uh, some positive developments, I think, are extremely important in order to change the public opinion picture. I have some maps here that uh, we can uh, discuss later. Uh, other issues, as I said, would refer to the issues of economic governance. Uh, relations between the federal government and the constituent states are extremely important and very sensitive. The questions of political equality will be put there. The question of efficiency of the federal government will be put there. Uh, questions about uh, sovereignty allocation between the federal and the constituent states, relations with the European Union are very important issues. Maybe the second most important issue of the territory is the question of security, the presence of foreign troops, uh, the founding treaty of the Republic of Cyprus allows for the presence of Greek and Turkish troops on the island. Britain, Greece, and Turkey are guarantor states. Anyway, Britain has sovereign bases on the island. This is something that may be uh, the focus of negotiations, uh, especially I know that the Greek Cypriot view is that the island should become demilitarized, so no troops would be allowed on the island. Turkish Cypriots have maybe legitimate security concerns about this. So there has to be a sort of discussion on how we can find the solution. The European Union might be a way to uh, come through these uh, difficult negotiations. Having said that, of course, we need to highlight how the Cyprus economic crisis played into this situation. As I said before, the Cyprus crisis was a derivative, was a spillover of the Greek economic crisis. This uh, took place mainly because of the fact that Greek, uh, Greek Cypriot banks were heavily invested in Greek debt, in Greek bonds. And uh, when the Greek uh, bonds uh, haircut was announced, they were extremely exposed to that. So they lost half of their money. And what made the situation more difficult in Cyprus was the fact that the Cyprus, Cypriot economy had, was relying excessively on the banking sector. Actually, we can even argue that there was a banking sector bubble in Cyprus. The size of the banking sector in Cyprus was seven times the size of the GDP of the country. So this meant that the country could not save the – there was no conceivable way that the country's budget could save the banks. So that raised uh, the discussions about bringing the European Union in, the Euro, uh, Eurogroup, there was a lot of uh, negotiations at that time. This was the first week that Anastasiadis came to power. So it was a very unpleasant situation for him because he was paying for the sins of the previous government. But his management wasn't very good either. In a sense, he agreed on he uh, was he agreed on a deal in Brussels, and then he failed to deliver the Parliament's vote. As a result, following this negotiation, this made a very bad impression. Of course, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. in European authorities, and in the end, uh, many Greek Cypriots would hope that Russians or other countries would come to rescue the uh, Cyprus banking sector, not least because of the fact that the Russians were among the biggest depositors in the banking sector. This never materialized, so Cyprus had to come up with an agreement with the European authorities, which was arguably worse than the previous one. So it was a very painful week for Cyprus. But as I said, uh, the adjustment of the Cyprus economy and society has been, in my view, better than the Greek one because of the absence of these deep social and uh, political problems that exist in Greece. So in that respect, uh, the response of the Cyprus 
of the site Cypriot economy to the economic reform program has been much more spectacular than the Greek case, in my view. So that's something to keep in mind. At the same time, there is the discussion about the energy resources, which I think it's important to, to highlight. Let's talk about this issue. This is the map that I think is important to keep in mind. You see that uh, there are a number of plots numbered. Uh, all of these plots are on the southern side of the Republic of Cyprus. So they're not directly involved with a sort of uh, the Cyprus issue. It's not in the Turkish-controlled northern part of the island. Actually, the area whereby the findings have taken place is number 12. Yeah. There is a so-called Aphrodite natural gas field that has been explored by an American company called Noble. And substantial findings have been confirmed. However, these findings are not as big as initial estimates were. And that's very important because the size of the findings or the potential cooperation between Israel and Cyprus play a major role on how these energy resources may come to the market, may access the international energy market. Why am I referring to this? Because uh, the way to develop these natural gas fields would be either to develop a pipeline that would be the cheapest and fastest way. And if you look into the geographic situation, the most reasonable thing, like let's forget the Cyprus problem and the situation with Turkey would be through Turkey. Of course, the problem with Turkey makes this impossible at, the pom at this moment, but it also provides an additional pushing factor for conflict resolution because this would mean that Turkey will have access to more energy resources. Turkey's role as an energy hub will become stronger. And Greek Cypriots will have a very sort of easy way to make money out of their natural gas resources. The alternative pipeline to Greece would be a much more difficult task because of the fact that it's much further and the waters are much deeper. So technically speaking, it would be a much higher investment and it might not justify the, the uh, quantities of natural gas might not justify this investment because there might be more gas there, but we don't know yet. And the investments of this scale can only take place on the basis of confirmed findings. The third case, which appears to be popular among many Greek Cypriots, is development of the LNG terminal. This means that the Republic of Cyprus would build a unit that would liquefy this natural gas and then ship it in specially made ships, not only to the European market, but also to the Far East. But actually, the more higher prices for natural gas today are not in Europe, but more in the sort of Far Eastern markets. What is the problem to that? The problem to that is that this requires very substantial investment. And for this investment to be meaningful, one requires more natural gas than it's currently available, proven in, in the Republic of Cyprus. So I mentioned before that there was sort of disappointment about this Aphrodite natural gas field. The disappointment refers to the fact that at the beginning, uh, Greek Cypriots hoped that just this natural gas field would make visible an energy project. And it proved that this is not the case. So it, they will need more findings, which are likely but not certain, in order to build this LNG unit, or they may need some Israeli natural gas. So a partnership with Israel might be another way to solve the problem. And that's something that has been going on in negotiation between Israel and Cyprus. But this, of course, uh, touches upon other security concerns of Israel. Israel has, more has confirmed more na has more natural gas findings than Cyprus, and it's part of the exclusive economic zone of the Asian Mediterranean. Of course, Israel cannot build a conventional LNG unit on its territory for terrorists for security concerns, because LNG units are perfect terrorist targets. So Israel's option would be either to ship this uh, gas to another country, like Egypt or maybe Cyprus, but this would develop a sort of dependency of Israel on this specific country, and Israel is not very happy with the situation, as you can imagine, to develop a dependency on a neighboring country, no matter whether this country is friendly or not. 
The other option would be to build a sort of uh, offshore LNG terminal, which appears to be the most expensive option, but it appears to be the option that is right now the sort of the preferred option by the Israelis. So it will be far enough from this sort of coastline so that it wouldn't be an easy terrorist attack target. So this is how the situation is at the point. As I said, uh, most Greek Cypriots uh, would look favorably towards uh, the LNG terminal, especially those who not, don't have a strong interest in the conflict resolution of the Cyprus issue. Others would see the project of building a pipeline to Turkey as an instrument towards creating new incentives in a negotiation with Turkey on the resolution of the problem. Of course, there are other parameters that need to be considered, uh, and I think that's sort of that's something that uh, all energy projects will have to kind of discuss, is that uh, energy prices are considered to be, all the, the feasibility of these projects are based on fixed given energy prices, but for example, the arrival of shale natural gas in the United States in a few years may completely change the picture of energy markets in the world. So all these discussions assume some high natural gas prices. Mm. If this is not the case, then all this discussions may, lo may lose a lot of their meaning. So, uh, we've already discussed this. Let me add another parameter which I think is very important. Turkey's view on the Cyprus discoveries, of course, is affected by its position on the Cyprus issue. So Turkey refuses the right of the public of Cyprus to exploit natural resources because it doesn't represent the Turkish Cypriots. So, in a sense, Turkey claims the rights of uh, the Treaty of Zurich of 1959-1960 and considers the Republic of Cyprus bound by them, which I think is a valid point as long as Turkey would recognize the Republic of Cyprus. There is a sort of interesting situation there because Turkey on the one hand re refuses to recognize the Republic of Cyprus, claims that there is a Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in the island but no Republic of Cyprus. On the other hand, it claims that the Republic of Cyprus should fulfill its obligations from the treaty that Turkey fails to recognize today against Turkish Cyprus. So it's a sort of a situation that is not very convincing in my point of view at least. What is very important though, I think, and that's something that needs to be highlighted, is that uh, there is a lot of sort of pressure towards the Greek Cypriot government so that a statement be made about the future uh, allocation of the energy wealth so that Turkish shippers are not excluded from that. There have been suggestions, for example, to uh, deposit 20% of the energy resources towards an account that will be Turkish Cypriot account mm -hmm. when the solution of the problem comes true. I hope that given the slow pace that such investment projects materialize, that we may come up with a solution to the Cyprus problem before the sort of four or five years that will be necessary for this revenue to start flowing into the coffers of the Republic of Cyprus. This discussion about uh, energy resources in Eastern Mediterranean has had a spillover effect over the Greek-Turkish disputes over uh, maritime zones. This is one of the long-standing disputes mm -hmm. between Greece and Turkey. It refers mainly on the Aegean, but it has expanded now into the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, it used to involve territorial waters and continental shelf, but it now covers the newly developed concept of the exclusive economic zone. So this is another parameter of the Greek-Turkish conflict. What is very interesting, of course, here is the role of Greek islands, because Greek islands give Greece a strong advantage against Turkey as far as the delineation of the maritime borders is concerned. And uh, while there have been long negotiations between the two sides, I think there have been 55 meetings of explore, exploratory meetings between uh, diplomats of both sides. And I think that there is a sort of blueprint of a sort of solution in that, but this requires, of course, political will and resolve to put this forward and bring the issue to the International Court of Justice as the official position of Greece, at least, has been. Uh, this hasn't materialized in the recent years. 
A lot of attention has attracted one of the, the easternmost Greek island, uh, which is east of Rhodes, between Rhodes and Cyprus, the island of Megiste or Castellorizo, and you may, can see that on the map. Mm. This is a map that reflects the Greek, let's say, maximalistic views about exclusive economic zones. So you see the red arrow points at the position of uh, island of Castellorizo, which gives this huge kind of additional territory against the Turkish map. zone. <laughs> yes, exactly in that position. Uh, of course, Turkey refuses that this island has any right and any influence on the delineation of the maritime zones. If you ask my opinion, uh, if you look into the decisions of the Euro International Court of Justice in The Hague, normally compromise solutions found in such uh, cases, maybe 50 percent, uh, kind of a weighted contribution of the island into the uh, delineation of the zone, maybe 50 percent, 60 percent, I don't know, like it changes from time to time, but nevertheless, it's neither 100 percent nor 0 percent. But I think that's a very important parameter of uh, the future energy negotiation, especially if there is this hype and speculation about energy resources exactly in the sort of, in this part of the Eastern Mediterranean. So, to sum up with the case of Cyprus, we don't have time to talk about Greece and Turkey, I think that uh, the European Union has to actively intervene in the negotiation process and build up mutual trust and confidence. And energy findings in Cyprus can increase the incentives for the resolution of the Cyprus conflict. But that's up to the leaders to decide. So I think that energy findings may also be used by sort of by maximalistic political leaders as the opportunity to become richer and then military stronger and then try, try to change the security balance in the island. Mm. Uh, such voices are expressed. That's no surprise about this, but I think it's important for the European Union to be proactive and uh, shape a discussion about energy in a way that helps the solution of the Cyprus problem and doesn't make an obstacle to it. And uh, that's why I think that external actors can help reconfigure security dilemmas and definitions of national interests in the case of Cyprus. So, if we look into the case of Greece, let me go back to the my presentation. As I referred before, I think that the Greek crisis has bigger dimensions than the crisis in most other European countries. It's far from just economic. The country came to a low point, a dangerous low point in June 2012, that it came, faced the prospect of exiting the Eurozone, really. I mm. think that this is no more the case. However, there are some key questions that remain open. In a sense, the country has been able to deliver some successes in the, fin in the fiscal side of the story. So the government will announce a surplus for the first time in many decades, current account surplus, but the way that this surplus has been achieved is a very unhealthy one. In a sense, it's based on taxation of the same and the same sort of, let's say, loyal and tax-paying uh, citizens. It's not a, uh, due to the resolution of the problem of tax evasion. It's not through the sort of creating new national income and generate, and it's not through cutting expenditures in sort of inefficient sectors of the economy. And many of the key underlying questions of reform remain unaddressed. So both deregulation and privatization are far behind most of the other Eurozone reform country cases. And I think there lies a fundamental question of justice and trust towards institutions because the costs of, the, of this adjustment have been very unevenly distributed within the society. I think this uh, increases mistrust against institutions and leads people to vote for anti-systemic or sort of completely uh, uh, crazy political choices like the neo-Nazi political party, for mm -hmm. example, or sort of parties that just uh, appeal to the sentiment and not to the logic of the voter. So just promise like the old paradise that has disappeared now, but there's no way that can come back, but they just think that by voting for these people they will be delivered something like this, which I think is not the case. 
Nevertheless, I do think that there is an interesting parasitation there in the sense that uh, Greece hasn't gone through what Turkey went through in 2001 when a major economic crisis led to a complete uh, refurbishment, renovation of the political system. So new parties came to power, all parties disappeared in Greece. Still, we talk about the same political parties, more or less, more or less the same politicians that brought the country into the, this situation. So there is a fundamental question of trust. How can these people who are responsible for the mess bring the country out of the mess? So we haven't seen new political parties coming out of this crisis yet, apart from the sort of say, the extremist sort of anti-systemic political parties. And we also see that, in many respects, the coalition government that consists of the two leading all political parties, PASOK and New Democracy, are trying to rescue the old clientelistic corrupt network that they used to rely on. Of course, the pie is now smaller, so the country is poorer now, but the structural changes that are necessary appear not to be coming very fast. So there's an interesting position of the European Union right now, how to, the European institutions, how to make sure that these reforms do take place even against the sort of willingness of the coalition parties that try to protect their own sort of clientels, their sort of own political interests. So how is this uh, affecting uh, Greece's foreign policy and how it affects kind of relations with Turkey? Well, this crisis could have a spillover of uh, security issues. But this appears not to be the case. I think that Greece's embeddedness in Western institutions has prevented major crises. I'm not sure that the situation would be as stable if Greece had not been part of the Eurozone or the European Union. There were some concerns about the current prime minister. Uh, Andonis Samaras used to be one of the most nationalistic figures in Greek politics in the 1990s and uh, there were concerns about his policies following his rise into power, but nevertheless, this didn't prove to be the case. So it didn't make any fundamental changes. And I refer both to relations with Macedonia, for example. Masamaras made himself famous by bringing down the government in 1993 as a result of the Macedonia issue. Uh, with regards to Turkey, again, he was considered to be a sort of a a hawkish political figure against Turkey, Greek rapprochement. Uh, this didn't happen again. The negotiations went on as usual. And uh, even negotiations regarding the delineation of the maritime zone. Samaras had promised before the election that he would unilaterally declare an exclusive economic zone against Turkey's views on the issue, but he didn't do that. So he kind of backed off from uh, political promises on this issue. So, and I don't find, I don't think that he will be very much interested in the Cyprus issue. I don't think that he would push developments towards conflict resolution. But on the other hand, I don't see him as a sort of a big obstacle. I don't think that he will try to rally support for a nationalist cause that will try to derail negotiations in Cyprus. In any case, the position of the Greek government, uh, like in its foreign policy, is definitely affected by the economic situation. And this is a map that reflects one of the other issues that are under Greek and Turkish negotiation process. This is the territorial waters in the GNC. On the right, you see the current situation with six miles. On the, right, on the left hand, you see the situation with 12 miles of territorial waters. Most of the countries in the world, they have 12 miles of territorial waters. Turkey claims that the GN is a special case. It shouldn't be, uh, the 12 miles should be the case because then the GNC would become a sort of Greek sea. That's something that is up to the negotiation process, as I said. So this is the map. So how about the presidency? Because we shouldn't forget that Greece is the president of the European Union right now. The timing is interesting because the EU, despite all these bailout efforts in Greece, appears to be rather unpopular among big parts of the Greek public opinion. Greek politicians, the Greek political system has managed to deflect the anger of the Greek public from themselves towards the European institutions to a very significant degree. Uh, but I do see that it's, it would be hard that the Europe, Greek government and the Greek presidency would escape from economic governance considerations in this 
presidency. In the past, Greece used to try to put forward its own sort of foreign policy agenda through its presidency, so support Cyprus, so sort of try to promote some Greek sort of strategic interest in the region. Right now, economy is so heavy on the agenda that I don't find this is happening anytime soon. In any case, uh, even in the Ukraine case right now, you see that uh, there's no sort of strong involvement mm -hmm. in that respect. So as a conclusion to the Greek case, I think that uh, short-termism will prevail, that the government is trying to survive very strong political pressures within. There are upcoming EU elections in Greece, as in Spain, and uh, there is a lot of concern by the government that uh, very strong support for the sort of extremist or sort of anti-systemic parties may weaken the confidence of the uh, part of the government. And uh, I do think that reform and not austerity will decide the outcome of the Greek crisis. Having said that, I don't expect any major sensations in the realm of Greek foreign policy as far as Turkey is concerned as well. So to come to the Turkish case quickly, although we made some points already, so I won't spend too much time because we'd quite like to have this discussion with you as well. As I said, the European crisis contributed to Turkey's reduced interest in EU membership. Turkey had started losing its interest before the crisis, but after the crisis, Turkey appeared to be a sort of success story while the EU was appearing to be a failing case. But I think that in the absence of European conditionality, the authoritarian tendencies that were there in Turkey rose much faster. So uh, I refer to the sharp polarization of domestic politics that first appeared in the Gezi protests, the sort of the story, the protest about the future of a park in the heart of Taksim Square in Istanbul. That reflected a lot of, it's like, you can ask why, what is in a park? Actually, the park is the, was for the straw that breaks the camel's back. There are lots of other issues that remain unaddressed. Through the political party system, there were lots of other concerns, fears, uh, that uh, especially the secular segment of Turkish society was facing. And this story appeared the opportunity for a sort of an outburst of all this accumulated pressure and uh, concerns. The other case, which I think is also very important, is the 17th Semigraph investigation and the reaction of the government against the Gulen movement. In a sense, that's even more interesting and important because it reflects a rift within the government coalition, within the government party. While the Gezi events could be considered to be uh, originating from the opposition forces of the government, this crisis now refers to the heart of the AKP electoral base and has highlighted not only rising authoritarian tendencies, but also concerns about as important principles as the rule of law and sort of separation of powers. There are sort of very important considerations I think to be made out of that. So a lot of the progress that Turkey achieved over the last 10 years as a result, maybe 15 years if we are beginning from the 1999, as a result of this democratic reform, EU reform process, are being lost a significant degree over the last years. And you look into laws about internet, sort of freedom of expression. There are lots of sort of negative signals in that respect. I think this is a very important uh, negative influence as far as Turkish foreign policy is concerned as well. I refer to the Turkish role as soft power in the region. All these news remove the appeal that Turkey used to enjoy in the region. I remember myself uh, like I was in Damascus before the war began, like for almost a summer, uh, learning Arabic. Like Edward mentioned <laughs> this already. <laughs> and I remember that Erdogan was more famous in Damascus than in Ankara. Like it was kind of, it was like a pop star in the Arab world. Like it was impossible to find someone with a negative view of Erdogan and Turkey included. Because Turkey appeared as sort of a shining star country growing in economic terms, country that was like kind of culturally relative to the countries in the Middle East, and yet successful in many ways that uh, could be emulated by the people and the countries there. And all this disappeared in a couple of years. It's surprising to see that Turkey moved to the opposite extreme. And in that respect, 
uh, it also highlighted other problems of the Turkish political system, which are not linked to foreign policy, but I think they are very important. So this tendency towards majoritarianism, the idea that elections mean democracy means elections, and elections means democracy, and there is nothing after, like nothing else after this, as well as the absence of democratic checks and balances. I think that's a very important feature that we need to consider. Uh, that right now power attempts to accumulate in the hands of the prime minister. To a way that, uh, in a way that authoritarian tendencies are almost natural to exist if there are no institutional mechanisms to prevent this power accumulation from taking place. So, uh, if we look into the foreign policy, because as I said I have more slides to talk about, we don't have much time. As I said, uh, Turkish economic foreign policy. Uh, was indexed to the economic and political success of the country. I do think that there are some warning signals in this. And uh, as uh, Eduard said, it's true that the political crisis in Turkey creates an economic crisis of its own. But I think that the economic figures were not as rosy as they used to be, like three or four years ago in Turkey, even before the political crisis. Of course, this has a sort of vicious circle effects so of more political crisis picks, more economic crisis, and vice versa. So I think that uh, warning signals about the Turkish economy are also important parameters in uh, the limited admission, um, sort of the limited capacity of Turkey to deliver what was promised to many Middle Eastern countries in the outset of the Arab Spring. Turkey appeared to be a country that aspire to lead the developments in the Arab world, sort of provide example, even support. Uh, I think in particular the case of Syria was very important in that respect because Turkey, because of the very close relations between the government of Turkey and the government of Syria at the beginning of the war, I think that Turkey in the beginning thought that it can, uh, the Prime Minister Erdogan thought that he could convince Assad about the necessity of reform at this point, this proved to be futile, and then Turkey shifted completely its position from supporting the Assad regime to support the opposition. And uh, I think that Turkey bet wrongly, as it proved, on a very quick collapse of the Assad regime, as in the case of Libya. So they thought that it would be something like an uprising, like in the case of Libya, and then things would come back to a new uh, norm, and Turkey will be part of this new norm, nevertheless. Syria was not like Libya, and uh, Assad was able to turn a popular democratic revolution into sort of sectarian war, which very much legitimized his position because he appeared to be defending the rights of the Alawites and the Christians against Al-Qaeda kind of like figures that emerged on the opposite side, and Turkey appeared unable to shape this. So on the opposition front, the extremist sides took the power, took the upper hand, the secular, sort of more pro-democracy opposition forces lost the ground against the extremist forces in northern Syria, close to the Turkish border. And Turkey got entangled into a very difficult situation. It still is in many respects. In a sense, Turkey is likely to import terrorist pressures from Syria because Syria has turned into the hotbed of terrorism today. And another parameter, of course, is the rise of the Kurdish situation within Syria as well. So the dynamics of the Kurdish question in Turkey are very likely to be influenced by what's happening in Syria as well. So in this light, uh, we can look into other cases of Turkish foreign policy as affected by recent developments. Uh, Iraq, for example, is another interesting case that actually supports the case made against that Turkey has been following an increasingly sectarian foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, Many Western uh, experts and newspapers accuse Turkey of siding with the Sunnis in Syria and not with the secular forces. Uh, the situation in Iraq appears to be lending credibility to this. Why? Because uh, Turkey is in trouble with the federal government of Iraq, which is Shiite oriented, and appears to be in unexpectedly good relations with the Iraqi Kurds, who happen to be Sunni. And this refers to the allocation of energy resources in northern Iraq, whether natural gas and oil from northern Iraq 
will be pumped to the international markets via Turkey, but with which, with whose signature, who is responsible to sign this agreement, who is going to get the revenue of this? Is it the federal government or is it the Northern Iraqi administration? So Turkey appears to be entangled in a domestic Iraqi sort of conflict between Erbil, Suleimani, and Baghdad. So relations with Israel remain difficult, uh, uh, sort of regardless of the attempts of the American government to uh, bring about a conflict resolution. And I think it's very important to highlight that the Israeli lobby has been has turned into a sort of a critic of the Turkish government. This was not the case, at least in the 1980s and 90s, whereby the Greek and Armenian lobby were trying to put pressure on Turkey and the Israeli lobby was trying to mm. alleviate pressure from Turkey. So it's a completely different situation. Here the natural gas case, which I discussed before, may be becoming an interesting breakthrough point. So last but not least, I'd like to refer to Egypt as another case whereby Turkish sort of overconfidence seems not to have paid off. Uh, Turkey appeared to be uh, in the heart of Egyptian transition ever since 2011. I remember the visit of Prime Minister Erdogan to Egypt where he recommended a secular constitution to the Egyptian authorities. These didn't like, this didn't cause a good reaction among the Muslim Brotherhood at the time. But these appeared the sort of role of Turkey that the West and sort of the international community would prefer to, that Turkey would try to export its own example of secular democracy to the Middle East. Ever since, there hasn't been any follow-up on that. On the contrary, Turkey's position has appeared to be sort of slowly identifying itself with a Muslim Brotherhood government and the President Morsi. So even when authoritarian tendencies of the President Morsi appeared to be on the rise, there was no friendly criticism from the side of Turkey. So when the military coup and the kind of demonstrations and eventually the military coup took place, Turkey was caught by surprise. And Turkey has taken a clear uh, position not to recognize the current Egyptian administration, unlike all other Muslim countries. So unlike Saudi Arabia, unlike Qatar, unlike the rest of the Western world that has developed some sort of communication with the new government, Turkey has refused to recognize the government of under the General Sisi, kind of under the control of General Sisi, arguing that this government is not legitimate, which of course is the case, but this is not, it's also the case with other governments that Turkey has been doing business with, like Sudan, for example, Gulf states, Azerbaijan. So in a sense, interestingly, this position limits the potential of Turkey to have an influence in Egyptian politics and Middle Eastern politics of the world due to the critical position that Egypt enjoys in Middle Eastern politics. So, uh, as uh, to sum up in that respect, I think that, as you see, as a result of this rising optimism about Turkish role in the Middle East, uh, Turkey has faced considerable strains in its ability to deliver what it promised to several actors in the Middle East. So there has been a trimming of Turkish role, and I do think that focusing on the domestic political problems of Turkey, I refer to the Gezi crisis, I refer to like, the graft investigation, I also need to refer to the Kurdish question. A serious discussion about the Kurdish question is imminent in Turkey, and I think that we keep on hearing about the Kurdish question over the last weeks and months, but it might be more of a sort of uh, political instrument for elections rather than serious discussion about bringing a breakthrough in the Kurdish issue in Turkey. So in that respect, uh, focusing on these domestic issues is critical for Turkey's role in the Middle East. But in order to solve these problems, I think the role of the European Union is critical. So I think it's the single most important external actor that can build trust and confidence between Turks and Kurds, seculars and conservatives, and help Turkey build institutions that are so direly necessary for this sort of the country's economic and political success. As I said already, in the, the recent investiga craft, craft investigation highlights the importance of institutions and the importance of independent institutions operating on the base of rule of law. So I'll stop here. And thanks for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Anis.